if you have an employee and they have just found God, you know, last week they weren't, you know, this religion, but this week, I mean, it's a sincerely held religious belief. And you just say, bull, that's absolutely not true. I just saw what you were doing last week on Facebook. And so we're not going to grant it. We're not going to give it to you. You're just, depending on what that employee wants to do, you're running the risk that you're going to have to go to a court and convince a judge or jury that it wasn't sincerely held. And that's, that's tough to do. Well, and I think, like I said, going back to that, like I said, I think it was 2020, but the decision by Justice Thomas out of the Supreme Court was basically a decision that said if you dig too much into an employee's level of sincerity when it comes to the religious belief, that that in and of itself could be considered religious discrimination. Good morning, HR. I'm Mike Coffey, and this is the podcast where I talk to business leaders about bringing people together to create value for shareholders, customers, and the community. Please follow, rate, and review Good Morning HR wherever you get your podcast. You can also find us at Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or at goodmorninghr.com. The Supreme Court ended its term earlier this month with a few decisions that caught a lot of employers' attention. Joining me to discuss those decisions and other HR news from July are Paul Simon and Dustin Paschal. Paul and Dustin practice law together as Simon Paschal, a boutique employment law firm in Frisco, Texas. Their bios are so bright that I'd have to wear shades, so I'll suffice it to say that they are both returning guests to Good Morning HR and very involved in the Texas HR and business communities. Welcome to Good Morning HR, Paul and Dustin. Thanks, thanks for yeah. Thanks for having us. We're happy to be here. This is the first time I've had two guests at the same time, so we're, this will be kind of an experiment for us. And quite honestly, between the three of us, as I look at it right now, this is an this is going to be a record setter for foreheads uh, space <laughs> too between the three of us here. There's a lot of forehead going on here. So um, the Supreme Court decided early in 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 July, late June, something like that that. Harvard and the University of North Carolina's consideration of race in admissions violated the Equal Protection Act of the 14th, uh, Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment and Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. Now, this was an employment case, and it seems like a lot of the commentary and some of the hysteria around this case missed that, you know, that this was not a Title VII case. And in most cases, use of race or sex in hiring decisions is already illegal. So, you know, given all of that, uh, let's just start with under current law, when can an employer even consider race or sex when making a hiring decision? Yeah, I think when I look at it, what, what we generally tell clients is the law says you consider that when you've got perhaps a disparate impact issue. And so when you're, when you're doing, uh, you know, your hiring or your promotional decisions and you look at kind of the makeup of your workforce of who you've put into these positions and you do the, the calculations that the law has for um, determining that, you might determine you've got your, your decisions are having, while facially neutral, are having a disparate impact on a race or a gender or national origin or something along those lines. And in that case, now you've got to take that into account to resolve that, or you're going to be guilty of or liable for uh, disparate impact discrimination. So in, in my mind, that's, that's really the only time you should be considering a protected category when making your decisions, because otherwise, yeah, you're engaging in intentional discrimination if you, even if you're trying to do it in a favorable way, like, hey, I'm going to decide I want this race in this position because we haven't hired that race in that position for the last couple of times. Well, now you've engaged in discrimination. But if you do that math and determine that position, our decision is a disparate impact, now you can consider it. But really, that's the only time, I'd say. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I mean, you know, I think, you know, a term that you hear a lot is uh, reverse discrimination, you know, um, and that's, you know, 
a white male believe, you know, it's, it's reverse discrimination. It's like, no, it's just, it's discrimination. If they're making decisions based on your race, whether it's a majority or a minority race, it's still based on race, which under Title VII or, or 42 USC 1983, you're not allowed to do. Um, you know, I think kind of like to tie into to the case, I think the issue is, you know, as an employer, especially kind of with our DE and I movement, is you do want greater diversity representation, and so the question is kind of how do you get that? And I don't think the answer is simply look at the race of the two applicants and the one that you don't have as much representation higher. I was at a Dallas HR educational event uh, last year, and it was a DE and I topic, and their HR panelists talked about. Essentially, what they did was they said, we're not getting enough minority applicants. That's our issue. It's, and so we're not getting enough quality applicants to decide who we should hire. So why is that? And their thing was, it's because we're not going to where they, they are. So, and one of the examples they said was they made a concerted effort to start going to HBCUs and recruiting campus there and saying, hey, you should come work for us, which then increased the applicants of the minorities. And they can, they're not actually saying we want this person because they're a minority. It's because they're a 4.0, they're the best, you know, they're the best interviewee. We're going to hire them. Yeah. And, you know, there, there are nonprofits like North Texas Lead that help, uh, you know, whatever you want to call them, minorities or traditionally, you know, underserved or underrepresented, uh, and they work at an executive level to find, you know, candidates for, for those jobs who are fully qualified and, and should be competitive with the rest of the, the candidate pool. And, but also reaching out to the right communities, paying attention to where you post jobs, paying attention to the language in certain job, you know, in your job postings that could turn somebody away. Um, and beyond just looking at race, if you really want to diversify your, uh, applicant pool, you know, one of the better ways to do that is look at what schools people have gone to. And, you know, are we always hiring our engineers from A&M, God forbid? And are we, uh, you know, or are we always, you know, uh, looking for this same pattern because, you know, you know, we see a lot more diversity, among social, you know, social groups and economic status and things like that. And that's what real diversity really means. It's, it's not just looking at the amount of melanin in somebody's skin. It's this whole bigger picture about, you know, what the, what the composition is. I mean, if you really think that's what makes you a rich workplace, right. It's, it's the fact that you've got all these different perspectives. And, and so, so if an employer, you, you know, I still see job postings where employers say they're an affirmative action employer, and then you still see plenty of them that say they're an EEO or an equal employment opportunity employer. Is there a difference in those two terms or, you know, cause it's, you know, on its face, when you say you're an affirmative action employer, what are you really saying? Yeah. In, in my mind, it's, it's using old terminology. Cause when I think of affirmative action, it's, we actually had a problem in our workforce and we are engaged in a program to resolve that problem. That to me is what affirmative action is as opposed to an EEO employer, an equal, uh, equal employment opportunity employer is just, we essentially, we follow the law. We, we don't make our decisions based on any category or characteristic that's protected under the law. We make it based on neutral decisions about your skill level and, you know, uh, whatever kind of testing we might engage in to get you there. Um, that to me, EEO, saying you're an EEO employer, I feel like makes everybody feel good. But at the end of the day, all it really says is we follow the law. Um, but at, like least, we, at least we say we follow the law. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> but the affirmative action is we had a problem in our workforce and we are engaged in a program to resolve that. And the key word in EEO, you know, the opportunity. I mean, we're giving everybody the same shot to compete on their merits in, in the workplace. So given the court's decision and their attitude and maybe some of the logic that they applied in the Harvard and University of North Carolina case regarding admissions, do you see, does that foreshadow 
Do you think anything, any, any challenge, you know, any challenges that they may see uh, and, and what their response may be to cu- current uh, diversity or DEI efforts that uh, a lot of you know, employers, especially larger ones, have, have implemented over the last few years? I don't really think so. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, courts are very good at saying this is very narrowly tailored to the specific issue before it. So, you know, future courts aren't going to, I think, extend, you know, admissions criteria to employment criteria. And I think even if you look at the decision from the Supreme Court, it's not saying that you need to ignore race. It's just, you know, you can't just say we need 20% to be this category. Um, But, and so I think from an employment standpoint, like I said, I think you can look at that, you can, you know, If you're looking at these two applicants and there's zero differences between their qualifications, you know, and, you know, make the decision because of this characteristic of this employee, we think that's going to benefit our workforce. I don't think you're going to have an issue. I don't know if I'd write that down um, (laughs) in terms of, you know, we're going to choose the female because she's female. But again, I think, you know, if that's kind of, if you look at the two candidates and that's kind of the the only thing that you see as a difference and gives that person that nudge up, I think you're going to be okay from a legal perspective. Yeah, I would mostly agree with that. I I think the, in my mind where I see this is, I mean, I think anyone that's followed the Supreme court since chief justice Roberts got on, they know that ending affirmative action has been a big deal of his. He's wanted to do that since he got on the court and he has the, court makeup now to do that. And so they were able to get that decision out. To me, it's less about does this decision extend to employers or are they going to extend it to employers? To me, it's more uh, showing us the environment we're in because I look at that and, and kind of compare it and put it in the same bucket as the Texas legislature, which just passed to end DE and I in state agencies, including state universities. And while, so that is in the employer and the employment context. Now it's only in the state agency context right now. It's not for private employers, but to me, it's more of a, what kind of environment are we in when we've got the Supreme Court ending affirmative action in an educational setting, Texas and other legislatures ending it in state agencies that they can control is the logical next step that they're going to try to end it in some fashion or address it in some fashion for private employers. And I don't know, because I think private employers are a little bit more likely to push back and use the power of the dollar to say, you know, that's not going to happen. We'll just move our company to a, a state that does allow us to do that. So I don't think it actually gets there, but that's a long winded way to say, I don't think that, the Supreme Court's decision here gets extended necessarily. I think it's just part of a larger environment that it, it might try to be somewhere extended. Yeah. And I, there there are going to be, I think uh, groups or individuals that feel like maybe they've been slighted in the past because of DEI efforts or things like that. Or, I mean, quite honestly, in my experience, most of the people who talk scream, uh, you know, reverse discrimination and things like that probably weren't the most competent person that they had to start, that that employer had to start with. And, um, and that's just, this is the thing that they're grabbing onto. Uh, but it's, it, it may be incentivizing them a little bit to go and try to find that counsel. And certainly there, there are groups out there that would be glad, you know, to pay for their legal bills, you know, to have that test case. And I don't know that there's much that an, a well, even a well-meaning employer can do to avoid that kind of, you know, situation. Is there anything you would tell an employer to, to try to avoid, you know, those kind of lawsuits that just want to, where they just want to test the waters? Yeah. I mean, well, I'll tell you what, what concerns me is, you know, and, and Paul can, can speak to this as well to answer your question, but we were actually just talking about this earlier. It's less about finding the case to test the waters because I've, We've seen in decisions from the Supreme Court this term and from the Fifth Circuit uh, in in just in the last several months, they are becoming much more willing 
to take cases that traditionally there's no standing. They're not ripe cases. There's no actual justiciable controversy that's arisen yet um, because they always say the courts are not designed to give advisory opinions. But it sure seems like lately they are moving more into the realm of giving, giving advisory opinions. So I don't know that I can coach an employer to say, here's the things you should or shouldn't do, because if someone really wants it bad enough, they'll say they are feeling threatened in some form or fashion. They'll find some organization that wants to foot the bill and they'll push it all the way through. But I don't know, you may see differently. No, I mean, I think that's, I mean, I think, I mean, the advice I would give employers is, you know, on the recruiting, interviewing, you know, just to avoid anything that gives the impression that any of those kind of categories of characteristics matter. Um, You know, we just had one come across our desk where it was, yeah, I mean, you know, where are you from to a person, a minority person and person was like Dallas. It's like, no, we're like, you know, Where's like your family? Where are from? you from? <laughs> and so, and then, you know, it was kind of, you know, okay, well, that's interesting to know. And then that person doesn't get hired. And again, that person's going to say, that was a weird question to ask. It must have mattered to them. And it must be the reason I wasn't selected versus some other thing. And so that's, you know, I think, you know, any indication of, you know, your race, gender, where you're from, you know, parental status, all those things aren't relevant and don't bring those up, even in casual, you know, what do you like to do in the, you know, do you and your family like to travel, I think can give someone the indication, well, they must have discriminated against me because they're worried I'm going to go on vacation all the time with my kids. So, well, and to to his point on that last one that we were, that kind of came across our desk, it was, I mean, even what you might think is an innocuous comment or a more of a, favorable comment. The the guy followed up in the interview with, oh, well, that's not a, a culture I'm familiar with. I'm going to have to learn about it. Now, he may have just meant, truly, he likes learning about other cultures and it's not one he's familiar with and he wants to know about it. Or it could be, hey, I don't know if I like that culture. I need to find out if I like it or not. Um, and so I think to your question about what can employers do, it's I think they can do a better job of training and advising their employees that are in that are doing the interviews about some of these innocuous things that can be taken the wrong way and put you at risk. Yeah, and there's there's a lot of of bad interviewing going on out there. And it's we you know, it goes back to the thing I'm always screaming about is somebody's really good at a certain kind of job, so we make them the supervisor of that group of people and we don't give them the training and we expect them to have what we consider common sense and how you do things, but without an understanding of federal and state law and precedent and why, how to conduct an interview and how to plan one and all of that. And I think that's, uh, uh, the, you know, the cause of a lot of offended applicants, uh, because it ain't none of your business and I'm, I'm just looking for a nine to five and want to go home. And you know, what I do on the weekends is none of your business. Uh, but at the, at, you know, at the same time, employer, you know, the, the hiring manager wants is well-intentioned, I think often, and wants to build a rapport and try to, you know, and try to see how they're going to fit in our culture. And I think too often fit is a, is not intended as a code word, but what they're looking for, you know, is this a good old boy who's going to go fishing with us on, on, you know, uh, on Saturday mornings or is, you know, uh, is he going to fit in with this group of people I have? And maybe the part of the problem in your organization is all the people in in your organization do, you know, have the same hobbies and look the same and have the same backgrounds. Well, it's funny because I I, I was going to say like to that point, it's part of that is knowing when you've got someone that maybe shouldn't be doing the interviewing anymore. Because I remember when I was leaving law school, I was in an interview for a job and there was a, and this will sound discriminatory in and of itself, but there was a very old lawyer from the firm conducting the interviews. And he asked me during the interview, was I planning to get married? And was it, was I going to have kids and blah, blah. And in his mind, that's what you did is you left law school and you got married and you had a family. And he wanted to make sure that I was going to do that or else he didn't know that 
I was the kind of lawyer that he wanted, regardless of my skill set. And so it's kind of maybe it's the time to kind of pull that guy off stage and say, you shouldn't be conducting our interviews anymore. And let's take a quick break. Good Morning HR is brought to you by Imperative, premium background checks with fast and friendly service. After criminal history, many people think about credit reports when they think about background checks. The truth of the matter is I spend more time talking employers out of using credit reports than trying to convince them to include credit in their evaluation of candidates. When I ask employers why they want to include credit reports, they often say that bad credit points to someone's honesty or responsibility. But for most employers, credit doesn't tell the story that they think it does. People can have a negative credit history for a lot of reasons outside of the individual's control. A spouse's job loss, personal or family illness, divorce, or any of a number of other issues. And in order to use credit history fairly, an employer has to be ready to have a pretty frank and uncomfortable conversations about why someone's credit is negative. And that risk getting into conversations many employers just don't need to have. Of course, there are times when a credit report is relevant to the role. If someone's making financial decisions on behalf of the company or clients, or if they have some other significant fiduciary responsibility, how they manage their own business may be relevant. Maybe if they have access to sensitive data, significant cash, or other easily removable assets, significant financial overcommitment might be relevant. But in every case, if they believe a person's credit may be relevant, I encourage employers to have those icky conversations about the underlying reasons for any negative information. At Imperative, we help risk-averse clients make well-informed decisions about the people they involve in their business. If we can help you in that area, please reach out to us at imperativeinfo.com. If you're an HRCI or SHRM certified professional, this episode of Good Morning HR has been pre-approved for three quarters of a recertification credit. To obtain the recertification information, visit goodmorninghr.com and click on Research Credits. Then select episode 106 and enter the keyword SCOTUS. That's S-C-O-T-U-S. And now back to my conversation with Paul and Dustin. Along that same lines, getting into people's backgrounds, the Supreme Court also decided in Groff v. the U.S. Postal Service that basically we've been doing religious accommodation all, all wrong all along. So, can you tell us tell us just what what that case decide what the you know what that case decided and what its impact on employers really ought to be? Sure. Like, I think that is one, another step in a larger process of expanding uh, religious protection in the workplace, because we saw it in, uh, I think it was 2020, the Supreme Court decision that Justice Thomas authored, where basically it was like, don't dig into someone's religious beliefs. I think this is another step in that saying, what, what Groff said was that people have been using this old case called Hardison. Um, and interpreting it the wrong way because of an offhanded comment in that in that case that basically um, focused on more than a de minimis um, burden when it comes to accommodating a, a religious uh, belief of an employee. And so the uh, employers have been ba- basically saying, it's a low bar for me to say, I can't accommodate your religious beliefs. And one of the main things they use is, if I do so, it'll anger your coworkers. Um, that's kind of been, been a big one. And so what Groff says is basically, no, 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 it's undue hardship. It's, it's not, we're not talking about de, de minimis. This has to be something that is, that is a substantial expense or burden or something to an employer. And while you can take into account coworker issues, that cannot be determinative because that's the whole point of why Title VII protected religious beliefs to begin with was that you might have coworkers who have an animus towards your religious beliefs or lack thereof. And so Groff said you can, you can, it's got to be this undue hardship, but then also you can take into account in coworker issues, but it still has to be the ultimate focus has to be on what's the burden to the employer's 
operations. So you got to tie back those uh, coworker issues to employer operations. And it's, it's also interesting, it, it wasn't a huge piece of the case, but it's something that we've put in training for years when talking about accommodations is you can't just say no when someone proposes an accommodation. It's really engaging with them to find an accommodation. And so that's, it's a small part of the case, but they basically reiterated that, that you've got to, you know, say, you can't just say what you propose doesn't work. You really have to kind of say, you know, what about this? Or can we do this? That's really engaging in looking at accommodations. Um, the one thing I would note on Groff though, is um, it, it made sure to say that you don't use the ADA process, even though undue hardship is like the ADA, we're not going to use the ADA process. Um, they left like a lot of cases, they left a lot for employers and lower level courts to figure out. But I think at the end of the day, the takeaway is religious beliefs in the workplace have substantial protection uh, under the law, particularly with the with our current courts. Um, and so employers need to be mindful of that and need to make sure they're they're doing their best to accommodate those beliefs unless there truly is an undue hardship. I thought what was interesting about this case is that, first of all, the Supreme Court for the last couple of years has really gotten hammered as being pro-employer and anti-employee. And this is a decision, you know, in favor really of employees. Uh, but the other thing is, is that it was a conservative Christian uh, plaintiff, whereas in my experience, most of the religious accommodation things I, you know, cases I see and requests I see, I've seen with clients are typically not coming from Christians. They're coming from, you know, non-majority uh, uh, religions, at least here in the U.S. And they're, you know, tend to be things that employers weren't expecting or weren't familiar with. Uh, and so, you know, and that those are going to you know, those kind of requests are going to get the, you know, I assume the same scrutiny, uh, hopefully from, from courts, uh, that, that the Groff case got going forward. So one of the issues that always comes up though, and we saw it during COVID with masks and vac vaccinations and all that is, well, you know, this thing you're asking me to do employer violates my religion. And, you know, the, the first thing you hear from, a lot of folks as well ask them to get somebody who's a religious leader in their organized religion to make this statement. But it goes beyond just organized religion, right? I mean, uh, talk about, you know, what should an employer who's either never heard of this this claim, you know, this, this religious belief, or uh, is just suspicious? I mean, suddenly this guy is asking for something that, you know, He's never asked for before. You know, he says it's his religious belief that he needs to be uh, on the water on Saturday mornings, you know, fishing and he can't he can't come to work. Um, you know, how deep should an employer dig in to try to evaluate? I mean, you know, or, you know, do we really even want to get into that as far as trying to evaluate the sincerity of somebody's belief? Yeah, I mean, that's the issue is, yeah, I mean, the, the standard is whether or not someone has a sincerely held religious belief. And, and to your point, Mike, it doesn't have to be, that doesn't mean it's a church. It's, you know, a religious belief. And again, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a, a God. It's, you know, it's their It's a moral belief. or ethical belief, right? I mean, it's... Uh... Exactly. And so now the you know, and the problem is, is courts are pretty clear on you know, we're not the moral police, we're not the religious police. And so we're not going to dive into, you know, well, I mean, you know, we think your 10 commandments are X, you've thrown in this 11th, but I mean, and so it doesn't count. If it's truly a sincerely held belief, which is just going to be a question. I mean, and that's, I would say, I mean, if as an employer, you 100% can, you know, tell me about what it is that you need and why, because to Dustin's point, there may be something else we can provide you. You know, I need, you know, two hours a day for prayer. 
well, if it doesn't have to be a certain period of time, we can work together to find, you know, an inconvenient or a time that's less inconvenient for the employer, but still get you your two hours. Um, but I think if you're going to, as an employer, it's just a risk. If you, you know, if you have an employee and they have just found God, you know, last week they weren't, you know, this religion, but this week, I mean, it's a sincerely held religious belief. And you just say, bull, that's absolutely not true. I just saw what you were doing last week on Facebook. And so we're not going to grant it. We're not going to give it to you. You're just, depending on what that employee wants to do, you're running the risk that you're going to have to go to a court and convince a judge or a jury that it wasn't sincerely held. And that's, that's tough to do. Well, and I think, like I said, going back to that, like I said, I think it was 2020, but the decision by Justice Thomas out of the Supreme Court was basically a decision that said if you dig too much into an employee's um, level of sincerity when it comes to the religious belief, that that in and of itself could be considered religious discrimination. And so we counsel our clients, unless it's a going to be a massive burden or inconvenience to you, just let it go. It's it's not worth risking a different kind of religious discrimination suit by trying to determine the real sincerity of their religious beliefs. Yeah, and the um you know those there are you know a lot of times your headaches are caused by those frontline managers who jump, you know, who may jump on Wikipedia immediately and look at the tenets of this particular belief and say, well, you're only a 40% whatever, because I've seen you do this and I, or you, you know, you don't subscribe to this or you cut your hair this way or whatever. And then some, then we're, then we're trying to say how good a believer they are in whatever that they're saying. And, uh, I know it'll surprise you too, but I even fall so- short of my own ethical, uh, beliefs on, on, on rare occasions. So, uh, you know, but I think that's, Sometimes our, our our supervisors can be too clever for their own good and uh, and kind of get themselves sucked into it. And uh, you know, with the, uh, the the grav case, I think that's going to be the other part of it is you're going to have a lot more people who where an employer said, "No, we've got to be fully staffed on this day or at this time, and we we can't accommodate that because you know it means changing significantly our staffing or something like that." But I mean, Mr. Groff was a part-time USPS employee. And I mean, he was, you know, it was part-time to kind of fill in for other people's needs. And the court said, well, you're going to, if you're going to have part-timers, I mean, they, they're employees and there's not a difference between. Uh, and so I think a lot of employers are going to have to reevaluate how they looked at that. Does this case pose any risk to employers who've previously used the de minimis standard? Uh, to make a decision and uh, should they be concerned or should they be looking back at decisions maybe recently that they made before this decision to try and reevaluate anything like that? Uh, you know, I, I'm not, I wouldn't be too worried about looking way far back, but yeah, maybe recently past uh, decisions I might reevaluate, but um, courts are pretty good about saying, hey, you've been operating under what what you thought was the law and we just, you know, outlined new law or at least a new understanding of the law. Um, so I, I don't think employers should be worried about past decisions. I think what you're likely to see is um, your your clever employees will come back and say, hey, I heard such and such in the news. Are you sure that I'm not able to blow up? Now we reevaluate. But I don't think employers need to necessarily um, go back and, and try to redo those past decisions. Yeah, you, you basically, I mean, it's like a 300 day statute of limitations. So anything that happened, any decisions you made more than 300 days ago, um, if the employee has not filed with the EEOC, uh, has lost that claim. But to Dustin's point, they may try to, you know, rekindle it by bringing it back up. So the the last decision that seemed really relevant from from uh, the last six or eight weeks was the uh, the ability of for employers to sue unions for damage caused by a strike, not by strikers who are throwing window, you know, gla- uh, rocks to break glass or anything like that, but um, in Glacier Northwest, 
the concrete company, uh, the employees went on strike and there was spoilage because the concrete that was already set aside and, and whatever that process is to, you know, to cure or whatever it does, uh, is, was spoiled. And the employer sued the Teamsters Union for, for that damage. And basically the court said, well, yeah, they can, that, you know, that they can, uh, they can sue for, you know, what they call property damage. Is there, you know, we're in the middle of hot strike summer and I really want to get to that, but this seemed like a segue, but is there anything around that, that employers ought to pay attention to, or do you think that's just something that the union organizers ought to pay more attention to? Yeah, I think that's more of a union organizer thing. I, I don't, uh, that's, to be honest, not one that really pinged our radar all that much um, because I don't think it's necessarily something for employers to worry um, too much about. I think that becomes more between the you know the union employees, the union organizers, and and things like that. Um, to me, it's just kind of indicative of again a trend in this Supreme Court of it's just going to be a little bit more employer friendly than union friendly. And I think this is just another step in that piece. But we are in hot strike summer. It seems like everybody's going on strike in the last few months. And I, I, I wondered if I, if I went to sleep and woke up in France, cause it's just like left and right. But uh, Axios ran some numbers and in the first half of this year, the number of individuals on strike doubled over the same period last year and it's seven times more than that, that same period in 2021. So there are a lot of people on strike uh, right now, the actors and the writers and Starbucks, uh, Boeing suppliers, even news reporters are on strike. Um, what is going on? What's y'all's take on that? <laughs> and why aren't, why aren't y'all fixing it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's just, so hot and everybody's angry and it's got everybody more willing to fight back. I, I, I think probably some of it is, you know, this higher cost of everything. I don't want to use the I word. Um, but I think some of it is that and employees saying we need more money and employers trying to, at least from my experience, employers, although they're doing okay right now, they're worried. And so they're kind of, pausing things and slowing things down to be prepared in case something happens because they don't want to be caught flat footed. And so I think as a result, you know, you're not seeing, you know, my wife works in HR and, and I, and so I, I see it through, through that. And you're not seeing the types of raises that they were giving the last couple of years. You're not seeing the types of bonuses that they were giving the last couple of years. And so I think, um, employers are tightening the reins a little bit more. And as a result, employees are now kind of resorting to, well, then we're just going to strike, um, you know, and, and get our, get our money that way. That's, that's the best explanation I can come up with. Cause I'm not, I'm not sure that I see really any other change in workplaces um, beyond that really. See, you know, I think it's AI. I mean, I think okay. if you look at, I think there is a legitimate fear. I mean, you look at all those groups of people you just described, they're replaceable by AI. And I think um, I think there's this fear of we need to figure out a way to curb that or at least keep our jobs and positions there. I mean, frankly, I mean, that's some, you know, lawyers, you know, we are the slowest moving profession out there, I think, in terms of jumping on with technology. But I mean, I'm seeing rumblings all over with, you know, the idea that AI can do an associate's, you know, document review in seconds where firms, I mean, you're billing out your associates, you know, tens of thousands of dollars a month to review documents that now AI can do in a split second. Where do you make up that revenue? Drafting documents, you know, I mean, split seconds versus, you know, the hours and hours that we have lawyers, you know, and all we do is bill our time. Well, if we no longer have to do that, what are we going to do? So I guarantee lawyers, and I know one judge, I think he's down in Waco, like he kind of prohibits you from using AI, chat GPT in your pleadings. Um, now, some of his rationale is more because of all the fake cases and, and you know, kind of right. inaccuracies you get. 
But I do think you're going to probably see, you know, our lawyers, we protect our, our business. So we will make a law that says, AI, you can't step in, you know, you can't practice law. That's an unauthorized practice of law or something like that. But I don't think you have that, you know, the writers, the actors, you know, I think they see we may not have a job. So let's try to, before that gets here, get a, a rule as to what's allowed. Yeah. And last week's episode, we talked strictly, a, you know, a 45 minute long episode, just talking about AI and HR. And it was probably not because I was involved, but it was probably the one of the more rational conversations. It wasn't AI is amazing and it's going to change everything. And it's, it's, you know, uh, ice cream on a stick, but also it wasn't doom and gloom and it was pretty practical. But one of the things you mentioned lawyers that I mentioned last week was I was talking to a, a friend who's an, a, an attorney with a large firm. And uh, right after all this chat GPT became really popular, one of the senior partners realized that an associate was feeding a bunch of client information into chat GPT, a public, you know, uh, you know, facing application that, you know, to help create pleadings and stuff, uh, at least first drafts. But then they realized we've got some client confidentiality and we're training, we're feeding this data that doesn't, they don't delete it after you search it. So whether it's lawyers or HR professionals, you know, what you put in there may show up in somebody else's, you know, results at some point and, uh, and people are sloppy. So I think, I think AI is part of it. I also think that the, uh, just we've got a COVID generation now. Uh, and, and they're just, you know, quite honestly, a lot of folks liked those government checks and they liked working from home and they liked the accommodations that employers gave uh, and they realized that often the emperor had no clothes. The employer said, "We this is how we have to do business. And and then we successfully did business a different way for a year, 18 months. And now we're going back to that way. And I think there's a lot of folks who are saying, nah, I'm not going to do that. And so, uh, and I mean, let's be honest, the unions have been really active in placing salts in workplaces. I mean, a lot of the Starbucks stuff, uh, you know, there are Starbucks organizers making well over six figures, uh, you know, that the unions are paying them to go, you know, be a barista for just long enough to stir up a workplace and, and get a bunch of people to sign up. And so I think that, you know, there's a whole bunch of things, but I think th the youngest generation of workers is a lot more amenable right now, uh, to, um, uh, you know, to, to union activity. And we'll see if we ever have the actual recession that everybody keeps talking about, we'll see how that, you know, changes attitudes and, uh, and, and makes people see that maybe they need to be a little bit more competitive in the market to, to, uh, to survive. And it's nothing like being in a layoff where you're you know, one of the more recent hires and you get termed, even though, you know, you're one of the more competent people in that work group and those kind of things will make a, well, well, suddenly, you know, everybody's uh, liberal until they've got something to conserve, and 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 suddenly that'll make a big difference in things. So, uh, any anything you would say inside, with given that unions are active and and employee activism in general is higher than it's probably been in in recent years. Anything, any advice you'd give in closing to an employer on that front? Yeah, I always wonder about that, and and. and I always wonder how much people want to hear advice that's not legal from a lawyer. But uh, in in when we look at our clients, without without naming clients, the clients that we deal with most actively in terms of issues they're having, versus the clients that we rarely hear from because they're not having that many issues, I can tell you the difference is um, culture. But culture in the sense of not nitpicking every little thing like the, the clients that we have that have the most restrictive PTO policies and the most restrictive, uh, you know, attendance and, and tardiness policies and the most restrictive anything. Those are the ones where they've got the highest turnover. They've got uh, the highest amount of employee complaints I understand that employers need to need to run their business and you got to have rules in place and you got to have policies in place. 
I'm not saying not to have those things, but I think there is somewhere in the middle between just being so restrictive that it just feels like you're a middle school student again, going going to school and, and having someone else determine every aspect of your life. And so I think it's important for employers to remember that and kind of remember you're still you're still dealing with humans um, and kind of how we deal with that. And the the most the most prime example of that, anytime I do a handbook review and I get to the bereavement policy, that's always the prime example of who's a more understanding employer versus who is not. And look at your bereavement policy, and that'll tell you if you're going to have uh, employee issues down the road, in my mind. You have 1.5 days to get over it. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Unpaid. Unless it's a close family member, and then it's 2.5. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But we want you in at 1 o'clock that afternoon. So, right. yeah. And I think I think it probably is still true that the employers that end up with unions are usually the employee employers that need a union, uh, you know, and, and, and yeah, I think there are exceptions, but often, you know, in my experience, it's, you know, I've seen, the cases I've seen, those are usually who gets one. So it may be changing just again. And I don't mean to throw a, a, the current generation under the bus, but I think their experiences over the last few years have been different and, and what their experiences, certainly their expectations into the workplace uh, are, are really different than, you know, my generation, Gen X or, uh, you know, because uh, apparently all we ever wanted to do was sit around, watch TV and get stoned. And so, you know, but now we're going to, we'll soon be running. So, so, um, but yeah, anyway, so that's where, uh, we'll leave it. I, I appreciate you guys joining me again today. Uh, it's always, it's always fun to get together. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks for having us. We appreciate it. And thank you for listening. You can comment on this episode or search our previous episodes at goodmorninghr.com or on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. And don't forget to follow us wherever you get your podcast. Rob Upchurch is our technical producer, and you can reach him at robmakespods.com. And thank you to Marianne Hernandez, our marketing coordinator. She keeps the trains running on time and holds me accountable. And I'm Mike Coffey. As always, don't hesitate to reach out if I can be of service to you personally or professionally. I'll see you next week. And until then, be well, do good, and keep your chin up.